cross oh. comes in. White with the header. Oh. And here comes Whitehead. It's gold for Great Britain. No, this isn't the latest episode of Sesame Street, and I am not Big Bird. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, I'm Richard Whitehead. And I'm Ellen White. Today on Track and Ball Podcast, we have an athlete of royalty background, gold medalist, and he is a Paralympian that's changed the dynamic of the sport. He's a phenomenal athlete at the age of 17. His first experience was Atlanta, and then a second experience, he really got the appetite for winning medals, a silver and a bronze medal, but that wasn't his showcase event. In London 2012, he didn't just win one gold medal. I don't know who's won one gold medal, by the way, at London. Mm. <laughs> or two, or three. But this athlete won four gold medals in his home city. MBE, CBE, he definitely should be a sir. This athlete is Dave Weir, the werewolf. Evening, How's it guys. going, mate? You all right? <laughs> what about that for an intro? Brilliant, mate. The best I've ever heard from the podcast. Yeah, you, you're definitely a badass anyway. And before we start with the questions, I think from a point of view of an athlete, there must be no athlete across any sport that's done what you did at 2012, mate. Like four gold medals, phenomenal effort, and there must be a knighthood on the cards. Come on. Come on, put it out there, Dave. Come on. Well, they should have. Well, should I have got it after 2012? There was a debate about it, wasn't there? I know there was a few questions asked about. It. To be honest, mate, I, I'm just honoured to get any honours from the royalties. You know, there we go. And, uh, humble, humble, that's Dave. It. Yeah, that's it, mate. I, I, you know, I'm not really bothered about things like that. Yes, if I got one, it'd be absolutely fantastic. It'd be another, you know, another medal to put in my, my cabinet or people say i must have a lorry full of of medals but half of them i don't even know where they are so <laughs> got so many. So, right, so. thanks so much for joining us today david um hey, you're welcome. First, firstly where did where did your nickname come from for everyone listening uh it's actually from rick edwards the tv oh yeah uh guy um it's not because you've got a hairy chest then no uh, mate, I haven't got one hair on my chest, so I don't know. Um, we was doing a program for Channel Four leading up to uh, 2012, and um, Channel Four's idea was to get normal people that had some sort of sporting background. They thought they were pretty good to get in a wheelchair and beat me over 100 meters. Um, so there was a bodybuilder, uh, a lifeguard, a gymnast. Um, a few other people and he gave them all nicknames and he was sitting there well i've got to give dave a nickname and, and that's where it come from the werewolf but it, it got it didn't really catch on then it was only till 2012 maybe someone mm. saw the, the tv show and then yeah then he, uh, rick edwards put it on twitter you know this, you know i formed and named the the werewolf so it really comes from from rick edwards really it's a it's a great I think, um, nickname because it really encompasses kind of your performances and it's um, it's something you've took uh, forwards uh, with, within your profile. And 2012, you talked about it a lot with about kind of the gold medal moments. Is, is 2012 something you look back with fondness? And what do people ask you about that event? Um, you know, a lot of people said, how did I deal with the pressure? I don't really know, to be honest. I, I can't really pinpoint it. But I always used to just say to myself that, because I always used to do the London Marathon every year, and the general public didn't really know Paralympic athletes, but they knew me because I did the London Marathon. So they just assumed I was going to win it. So in my head, I kept saying, people think you're going to win anyway, so you've got to pretend you're going to win. And that, and I sort of like built the pressure up like that. And, you know, and I just dealt it dealt with it like it was just the London Marathon, even though I was doing four events and it was a massive event. But it, it really, the pressure only got to me probably when I was in the village um, and, you know, seeing the other athletes. But for me, I was in the best 
mental, physical state that I've ever been going into a game. So I knew that it would have to, t someone to stop me was, they would have to put a lorry in front of me to stop me. And, and that's the mental state I had going in there. I just knew that I was in the best shape possible I could be in. I remember watching the games actually at some of your events and just like even talking about it, like, like goosebumps because that atmosphere in that stadium, mm. like talk, 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 how that felt. Well, they, they, I think all of us were still a bit worried. Are tickets going to be sold? Are we, you know, going to have crowd? And yeah, that was on my mind because, you know, when you're going around in a, in a village, it's always the Brits that would have got blamed for it, even though it's nothing to do with us. We're there mm. to compete. You know, it's like Rich in, 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 in a village, you know, if it's a home game, people come up to you and, go, and moan about things, you know, but it's not, it's not our fault. Yeah. So that was the biggest thing. But I could hear the crowd from the stadium, uh, from the, the village. So I knew it was going to be okay, but I needed to see it myself mm. to, to believe it. And I think when I did the 5K semi, I still didn't believe it until I was under the stadium waiting to go in. And I just looked up and there, I, there was an opening. I could see the top tier was packed. And it just put a big smile on my face. And I went out on the track and I thought, you know, I, I've they've done their job. Now I've got to do my job and try and please this crowd. And I think that's when I started getting nervous because I thought, right, there's 70,000 people here. I've got to perform for them because they paid a ticket to see me. And that was, that was it. Every time I went out, I just had to perform for that crowd because I felt they done me justice by coming and watching Paralympic athletes and I felt very proud to be out there. Yeah, and obviously your home city as well. It's, yeah. Um, it's something that you you took that on those big shoulders of yours as a bit of a responsibility as, as, as to obviously show the world what, what the real um, Dave Weir is all about. And I know Ellen, Ellen talks about the kind of 2012 and she says you're her second favourite athlete. I don't know who the first favourite athlete is. But apparently, it looks like Big Bird, apparently. Yeah. <laughs> um, but we, we talk a lot about performance in on the podcast and um, we're just really interested to know about kind of your structure in performance and and who do you rely on to keep on that, that journey towards those common goals? And it's really important, isn't it, to, to stay in the moment but we really want to know about kind of what your structure looks like and your like your coach that you have to rely on, etc. Yeah, I think it's all to do with with your mind. I think if your mind's in a good place, then everything seems to fall into place. Even though I've done some races and I've probably not been in the right state of mind, but I've always won or done well. And I've looked at myself, how have I done that? And I, I don't really know, but. You know, when my mind's good, I seem to push well and, and push even better because of that. But, you know, it all falls on my coach. She knows even by a phone call if I'm tired or, you know, what state of mind I'm in. And, um, you know, if it wasn't for her, I probably wouldn't have been the athlete that I am today and, and still going. You know, I'm, I'm 42 in a couple of weeks and I feel fit and fresher than I've ever been. But that's because of my mental state as well. You know, I had a couple of years where I was just, uh, you know, in a bad way, which I didn't even want to be on this planet at one point, you know. So there's a lot of people to thank, not, you know, not just my coach, you know, and, and um, a lot of support around me, my friends and my family. But, um, yeah, I think if your mind's right, your, your game plan's going to be right as well. Do you know, with um, that kind of support structure, would you say, so a lot of people say, oh, being given your support network, so whether that's coach, whether that's nutritionist, et cetera, is that the right way to form a, a team around you? Or would you say to cherry pick people that are really going to add value to yourself is more important? I think for me personally, I like to pick the people. Um, nothing against governing bodies and, you know, they try and help you as, as possible, but I've had some situations going into 2012 that, you know, governing body wanted to, you know, pick my strength and conditioning coach, pick my, you know, something else or something else, but it never worked for me. You know, I know the right people that work for me and, that, and that's what I wanted to do, leading into the biggest games of, of my life. And, you know, there was a few people at British Athletics that didn't like it. You know, the top man, at, you know, at the time, Peter Erickson, didn't like the way I was doing things on my own. But that's the way that... that it worked for me and um, 
you know, uh, and yeah, it just worked for me. And I always used to say to him, look, if you want me to win these all these medals that you keep telling people that I'm going to win, I need the right people that know me. And, and and that's just me. Some people like to have, you know, people picked for them, but I, I, I like to pick the people around me, to be honest. Yeah, that's what we've we've spoken to a number of different athletes on this podcast that's saying like their support network, everyone's singing off the same hymn sheet, um, you know, surrounding yourself with the people that know the goal that you want to achieve. Um, and it's trust as well, you know, mm. yeah. I'm trusting people. I, I was using my strength conditioning coach and my physio since 2006, you know, when that got taken away from me, it was... Um, it blew my mind a little bit because I was a gold medalist, you know, in 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 Beijing, and they took it away from me after and said that I had to go to Lee Valley and do this and use this strength and conditioning coach. But you know, some of them didn't really know about wheelchair racing, didn't know about Paralympic bodies, and I, it didn't work for me. You know, my 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 physio at the time was the lead Paralympic swimming physio, so it was just like right, that's perfect. And he's the number two guy in the strength and conditioning. Had been working with. Paralympic guys and they were based at St Mary's and it, it worked for me and there was an endurance group there anyway so um, you know it, and that worked so the, after you know all the troubles I had leading into to, to London um, you know I said I need to go my own way and uh, these are the people that are going to get me fit and ready for, for 2012 I'm sorry if it upsets you but you want me to win these medals I'm going to go my own way, and that, and that's what I did. It it was a, it was hard work because the hierarchy didn't like what I was doing, but I was doing Brave. it for my best interest Brave. and for them. You know, medals count for them. Medals count for money. Medal counts for you know the next you know funding for the next four years. So, you know, I wasn't just doing it for myself, and I wasn't being awkward or hard work. I was trying to, you know, I was only asking to keep my physio and my strength conditioning. Coach. I wasn't asking for extra funding. I wasn't asking I need to go away in America for six months on end to, to train. or So it was just that. That's all I wanted to keep. And um, and it worked. So, you know? Well, yeah, of course. You know, that's, that's brave to make the decision. And obviously for you wanting to keep those people, um, you know, that network surrounding you that are, that are helping you achieve your goals as well, really. And Yeah. Are, and after like 2012, you, you set up your academy, the We're Archer Academy. Yeah. Like, how, how did that come about? And, and can you say like what you want to kind of achieve with that? Yeah, the, the academy was um, sort of a vision I had in 2008 when I was in uh, Beijing. Um, we had a wheelchair racing squad there. And, and before that, I was, well, I was a little bit selfish. I was always worried about my performance and what I've got to do. And I literally was getting ready for a warm up, and I'm not being that well. I had glandular fever, so I was just thinking a lot about my future. I think, and, and you know, if I if I retire now, or if this illness doesn't get better, you know, when athletes you're just thinking and thinking all the time. And I thought, if I like come out of Beijing and go, I can't do it anymore because I don't know how long I'm going to have this virus. I don't know how long I can keep it up. Where's the next gold medalist? You know, I was looking at the team and it was good, but we medalled and we got a lot of medals, but it was only small. I think it was seven wheelchair races. So it was like, what's going to happen? I just started, pa not panicking, but just got a little bit worried about the sport. And that's when I started to feel the love for other athletes and really embrace the next phase of my thinking, really. And I looked at... Uh, developing countries coming in like Thailand, even China at the time, um, small nations that didn't have the backing that we had, you know, from, you know, lottery funding or UK sport or British athletics. And I thought there's something going wrong here. You know, that, you know, the American team are bringing 20 strong wheelchair racers that were probably all going to medal. And we've got seven. It's, it's, it's not right. So, and then I was looking at the numbers at the uh, British championships at Stoke Mandeville and, there'd be like 30 wheelchair racers and there'd probably be five top athletes that might get selected. And I thought that's not, that's not good enough. And so the, the idea was to, to set up an academy and um, my coach, when I come back, she said, it's a good idea. Let's wait for a bit. You know, we had a few athletes come in and out. It's because London 2012 took over my life and I had to really focus on myself, but it was always an idea that I had and I knew it was the right opportunity 
to hit it hot after after 2012, after the performances of Paralympians and wheelchair racing on on the track, and that was that was the goal. And it's um, it's going well. I've got three guys out here today uh, this weekend. Um, uh, one from Trinidad, um, a couple of GB athletes, uh, which could all be selected for for Tokyo, and we've got probably about 25 strong athletes at the academy from the age of nine years old up to about well my age you know 40 odd so old yeah old mate <laughs> you know how it is yeah <laughs> uh, so, and, and that and that's what yeah we do, i just love it we've got a few sponsors backing us now we've got a massive company called tarmac obviously you know the biggest tarmac company in the country which what do lucky. they make <laughs> so um, yeah, so we've got, we've got a few good, good backers at the moment that are um, that are helping the academy. So it's um, it's just getting stronger and bigger. And 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 I know Rich wants to come down and have a look at the academy and see how it's going. So it's um, yeah, it's good. So you've done some great work there, and um, obviously really encompass what what sport and Paralympic sports all about is the coming together of people and one thing that we we talk about a lot at the moment with the pandemic is that it's really tough for athletes just to train just to access facilities um, has it affected yourself as a person with a disability also some of the athletes that you've had with the academy because what what the able-bodied community don't think about or don't realize that it's not just the sports facilities that that we struggle with as as, as athletes, but also the access being a, a person with a disability as well. Yeah, uh, for me, um, the first lockdown wasn't too bad, and and the summer because um, I always, I was always praying that I was going to have a race, so I just kept training and training and training, and then. You know, when one race gets cancelled, you're praying for the other one. So you carry on training for that. Obviously, I don't do track racing, so I was praying for the marathons to still be uh, going ahead. So, yeah, it was a bit, you know, another one's been cancelled, another. And then I was so thankful that the London Marathon promised us that they would do a, a closed event and, um, you know, be in our own bubble. And um, and it, yeah, it went well. But I think for the academy... Um, we was lucky because of tarmac. Tarmac pretty much paid for everyone to have a pair of rollers just before the lockdown. So we all bought rollers. We we've just um, we we built a room as well, a roller room, an indoor facility for us to train in the winter, just off the off the track. So we've got this. Uh, yeah, rollers are, like, are, are for those that you put your chair on and you. Yeah, so it's a bit like a turbo. Off. Yeah, it's a bit like a turbo on a bike. Um, you spin your wheels, the front wheels um, are static, but yeah. So we was lucky that we had that. So everyone had a pair of rollers. So we was doing Zoom calls and we we're doing training sessions together. That's fun at the beginning, but then it gets a bit of the same thing, and you, you're stuck indoors. And, and and I was still going out an hour a day because we was allowed, and I was going. I'm still doing my training, but I think this lock, the third lockdown, was the hardest for me. Um, January. After Christmas is always hard for me, I found over the years, just to get motivated, mm. um, just to, you know, get the training going. But this time it, it was definitely worse for me, um, just because we didn't know if the Paralympics was going to go ahead still, you know. And I'm sitting there thinking, oh, do I really need to train? I'm still stuck indoors doing it. The weather was even worse this winter than I've ever experienced. Um, so it was tough getting out most days. So. Yeah, this winter was probably the toughest start I've had for a long time. And what what drove you to to go out and train and like was it the tools that you've already kind of installed or like what? Yeah, was it was it Tokyo your aspirations? Yeah, I think just the reason what gets me going after Christmas is because I know I've got the London Marathon in April. So, you know, I had so, I always have something to gear up to, but I didn't this year. Mm. So it was always like, oh. You just, you just had to uh, get over Santa. Not That's giving it, you the mate. And all that chocolate and stuff. Yeah, <laughs> so, um, yeah it was... 
yeah, it was just tough because I didn't have no goal. I need a goal. Mm. And that's why I've come back to Switzerland and, and to do some track racing because I've got no marathon before Tokyo. I've mm. got no preparation. I've got nothing. So I've just come here for a bit of fun and, you know, do some track racing just to get in that groove of being in a competition. You know, it's like, Rich, you can do all the training, you know, and, and, and try and mimic what you do in, in racing, but it's never the same. You know, your nerves, your, your, your adrenaline is never the same. So, yeah, yeah. It, it, it's just to to get the, the wheels in motion, I suppose, and get ready for, for Tokyo. Dave, you're a, a big advocate for mental health, and it's Mental Health Week uh, at the moment in the UK, um and we always talk about the the highs of um sport about those successes but also there's 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 a lot of lows and that can be after success as well so can you talk to us about some of the highs and lows that you've had in in sport and how and how you've coped with that um yeah. it, i think it's i think it's really interesting to kind of just delve into mental health because in lots of different athletes have lots of different um experiences don't they yeah yeah definitely um to be honest uh the last few years after to rio was probably the worst time of, of of my life um i just felt everything was going downhill and down the toilet really my my uh, relationship with my my uh, kids mum was was you know at its worst um you know what happened in rio with with jenny banks um it was just spiraling out of control and uh there were some points that i just didn't want to be here anymore to be honest there was there was thoughts in my head that you know what's the point of being on this on this planet and probably if i didn't meet my partner now i don't know where i'd be to be honest um and plus with with and having my kids as well you know they were they were my biggest thing in the back of my head you know um but it really stemmed probably you know, the pinnacle was was in Rio. You know, to and it's to, crazy, isn't it? How mental, yeah. how how you and, and I know athletes that men, mentally they're in such a low low point through sport, and people around the national governing body and people in power just let this happen. It's just a really frustrating thing that I think I think we need to take mental health more seriously because of the scenario that you just said. But did you coming out of that then? So obviously we're we're 2020, 2021 now. Did you have a roadmap that you you um, went through to guide you through that and to get better, or is that something you're still working on now, Dave? Do you know what, mate? It, I felt like I didn't have any help at all. You know, I I, I felt like I was a machine that has done its best now and now it's time to retire and forgotten about that's how i felt i felt like i you know i've won i think 26 medals in total for that's not even including the europeans i don't think i can't remember but i've won a lot of medals and won marathons and i just felt like after rio i just didn't get no support at all um and for me i thought it was the sport that's making me depressed you know when, when a coach is telling you that you're not worthy to wear a GB vest. You're not, you know, you should be, you know, pretty much do not ever come and compete again because of what you've done. She didn't know what I'd done. You know, I did the relay to help the team. I didn't have to do the relay, you know, and for me, to someone to accuse me that I'd, I'd done it on spite and slowed down on purpose. It's not me. Did No one yeah. asked me, are you okay? Are you all right? What's wrong with you? They accused me straight away. The only person that asked me in Rio when it literally happened because people, so many people saw it, was Tanny Gray. She said, And what was the scenario, Dave? What was that scenario that you're just talking about there? Sorry, what? I know, but the, I know, but the viewers and the listeners won't know what the scenario was there. What actually happened? Well, in Rio, obviously, I, I, well, we went to the European Championships before that and we did really well as a team as the relay. And they said, Would you do the relay? You know, you're definitely going to do the relay in Rio. I said, yeah, of course I will. I help the team. I do my races, but I said, I'm not going to focus on it because, you know, my races are more important, but I will do the team because we can win a medal. Yeah, of course I'm going to win a medal for the team. I, you know, that's me. I want to win as many medals as I can possibly can in my career. And um, literally, my, my races didn't go well. Um, 
it before the relay and I had a chat with Paul had done two days before uh, uh, the, the day before the relay and she said to me um should we pull you from the relay and concentrate on the marathon? I said, no, you can't do that because you brought out a young athlete just for the relay. Who's going to take my spot? There's no one to take my spot. You can't do that. It's not very fair on him. You know, I could have gone, yeah, all right. If I really wanted to be spiteful and horrible mm -hmm. to them people, I could have just gone and took the easy route and gone, yeah, all right. Then. Instead, I turned up at the track, not mentally focusing, not nothing. Didn't feel right on warm up, but I didn't tell anyone because I didn't want to let the team down. You know, I could have pulled out a warm up, said, "Don't feel right, don't want to do it." Now, more what that would have called World War One, uh, World War Three, then again, mm. wouldn't it? So mm. I was in a no-win situation. So I go and do my lap. I had no energy, nothing. Couldn't get up to speed. And, you know, and then I go back to the warm up track, and you know the, the head coach is running up to me saying I'm a disgrace for GB. I should never wear a shirt again. You know, and it, it just, yeah, it was the worst feeling ever. Do you know when everyone is looking at you, like they think I've I've thrown the race or I've done this on purpose. I'd never do that to the team. That's not in my no. makeup. Mm. You know, yeah, I'm, no, I'm a born, yeah. I'm a born mm. fighter, and I, I'm I'm you know I've been brought up on the council stuff to, you know. To win, and that and that's that's me, and and it it hurt me. It was the biggest thing that, and I think after that, my mental health just went down and down and down and down. And when I got back, it was um, see, I get a bit emotional take, talking about it because it's, I know that's where it, when I had it before that, but I know that's when it was starting. And it, you know, every time I went out, I felt like everyone was looking at me. You threw that brace. You was out of order. That's what I felt like. Everyone on the street, I felt like that. So I, I pretty much, you know, had meetings with British Athletics, and they said they were doing an investigation. You know, I could have uh, money by the story, but I didn't. I'd done it the proper way. I'd done it, you know, legit. I, I wanted them to do it the proper way, and the outcome was there wasn't enough evidence, even though there was a hundred people on the warm-up track to see it. So it, it. it 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 killed me and once i got that decision i, I just thought i don't even want to race anymore but i was sort of trying to train for for the marathon you know i've not missed the london marathon in 21 years <laughs> i didn't want to i didn't want to miss it but mentally mm -hmm. I, I some days i won't even train it some days i won't eat in um i couldn't it's get amazing out of bed. how it affects you isn't it it's amazing how it affects it, you it you know i was living back at my mum's as well and even my mum was like, she couldn't help. There was, I just couldn't do anything. And I would do the training I could. And I went to Port uh, was it Portugal or Spain? And I went to Spain on a training camp and did all right. And I just needed to do this race to prove a point. And it wasn't, it wasn't for me. It was, it's to prove the point to the rest of the world that I didn't fake that race. You know, even I won London Marathon in 2017 um, and when I crossed that line, I had no emotion. You know, I had my friends and family there and they said, you just won. I said, not bothered. It doesn't bother me. I've, I'm just not there. And that's when I said to, you know, that that race there was probably one of the hardest races I've ever done in for, for my mental health because halfway through that race, I knew I was going to win. And that's when I was going to tell people what problems I've had. That was, you know, I, I knew if I win, I'm, I'm going to tell people because for me, I think it was to help me, not not to help. Even though I know now it's helped thousands of people because I get messages to say thank you for speaking out about mm. mental health and stuff like that because mm. it was only till after that race that I spoke about it mm. and then I got counselling. And when I got counselling, she actually went back to my childhood and said that you've been depressed all your life. Not just, you know, I, mm. as a kid, I, you know, from the ages of really young, from five upwards, I used to cry every day and every night and say, why me? Why did you pick me? Why, you know, I'm on a council estate. I've got to be normal as possible. I can't play football. I can't ride a bike. I used to sit there 
in bed and just cry. And if my mum would come in, I'd hide. You know what I mean? I didn't tell my parents. I didn't tell them out because I didn't want them to be upset and stuff. So it really stemmed right back. And I didn't know that until my counsellor, when I started t talking to her about my problems, she said, you've had this all your life. You know, it's not just now. You've had to battle with these demons all, all your life. And, and um, I'm thankful that I did speak out because mm -hmm. I probably now I'm in the best mental state that I've ever been in. Yeah, you're looking massive. You're looking ripped, and you're in, you're definitely in a better. <laughs> Nearly. Come on, don't pinch the uh, the biceps, boy. <laughs> no, we re yeah, we really appreciate you kind of speaking about that, and and I'm sure some listeners out there will will really appreciate it. And um, yeah, the fact that you've spoken out and and helped so many people, I think that's really important, especially Mental Health Week as well. Um, yeah, I, you know, I, I, talking. Yeah, definitely. Um. I did an interview the other week with Anton Ferdinand and, mm. you know, we spoke, we was only meant to do like a 20 minute interview and it went on for nearly an hour and a half because we were just talking about all mm. the problems that we've had over our life. And it was just, it was just nice to talk to someone that famous as well and who's had mm. a foot background as well and had them, and them problems. And, and even just talking to normal people that come up to me, men, especially men saying, Thanks, Dave, you know, um, for talking out because I reached out after that interview I saw you on, on TV. It was like, it, it was really weird because I, in 2017, I won the marathon and then I went onto the stage for our final press conference. And then they asked me, how do you feel? And I, I just said, I feel all right. Mm. And they said, are you yeah. all right? I went, no, actually, I've got these problems and this, I've got wow. mental health and I've, been struggling since Rio. Well, I only fought till Rio, but it stems mm. back from, from years. And, and you could see the faces of the, the people that were talking to me that it just, mm. the penny just dropped. And they were like, yeah. How have you done this race then? I don't know. Mm. I couldn't, I can't answer it. Maybe some up there, someone up there helped me get through this race to, to you know, to speak out about mental health. Do you think this type of support? Is needed more in Paralympic Olympics? Do you think? Yeah, I I think it. Yeah, especially, yeah, in all sports, I think it's the aftercare. You know, mm -hmm. I know I'm still competing, but I went back because I realised that actually training was a good tool for my mental health. When mm -hmm. I thought the actual race, it was the racing that was making me depressed, not not the yeah. The, the training so what i did is i went back slowly to training and started to enjoy the training again then i picked the races that i wanted to do that mm. i felt like i was comfortable in and that's what i did because mm. i had no one saying you've got to do this you've got to do that and you know my um and my counselor at the moment um he said you're a pleaser you know, you want to please everyone but yourself. He said, it's time for you to do what you want to do. Just mm -hmm. say no. If you don't want to do it, just tell them. Just say no. I'm doing this because I want to do it. And, that, and that's, mm -hmm. you know, since I've been speaking to him about it and stuff like that, over the last couple of years, I've just got better and picked what I wanted to do. Mm -hmm. and, and had the courage to say no. I was always like, yeah, all right, I'll do it. But I didn't yeah. really want to do it. Do you know what yeah. I mean? Yeah, no, I totally I was agree. Pleasing it's, everyone it's... else but myself, and that, and that's what I did that marathon for. I felt like I pleased everyone else, not myself. Mm. Mm. Yeah, cheers, Dave, for your honesty, and uh, I that's think right. I speak for 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 myself and Ellen, and probably all the viewers and listeners that really appreciate your your honesty and, and mental health is something that we all need to think about. We all need to get support and talk and have people that understand but also so can can see hope for the future yeah. uh, so, so before we finish dave we have yep. 10 qu quick fire questions right so these are these are the most important part of the podcast you get these wrong <clears throat> you're in trouble yeah. so I'm first gonna, what i'm gonna so i'm gonna throw it out i didn't write any of these okay <laughs> just to throw it out <laughs> i got first one tonight. yeah yeah first one everybody has the same questions by the way First one, track or ball? Ball. 
I love football, Thank mate. Thank you. I'm, I'm tired of No, you training. don't. No, you no, don't. Really? You're an Arsenal fan. Yeah, but... <laughs> Thank so you. I like football, yeah? <laughs> I really appreciate you answering that question like that. Um, <laughs> okay, what's your greatest accomplishment in life so far? Um, my children. That's a great, um, great but, answer. Yeah. Mm -hmm. no Third question: Do you believe in ghosts? Yeah. Yeah. Ooh. Wait a minute. Now, see, the thing Ooh. is, though, it's I'm normally a quick, quick fire question. <laughs> Sorry, it is. No. It, is no, it is. But you need, to, you need, to, you need to expand on that one, though. Um. Why? Goes back to my childhood. I used to see him a lot. Okay. Oh, okay. My mum said I used to see him a lot. I used to say that there was a, a lady at the end of the by the door that's in the big big Victorian really? dress with with white hair. But, wow. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Okay. What's the biggest risk you've ever taken? Uh, coming here, I'm racing on the track again. <laughs> I thought you were going to say coming on this podcast. <laughs> <laughs> so coming to Switzerland, I'm racing on the track again. Yeah. No, looking forward to seeing those results as well, mate. Next question: Can you sing? No. But Ask if you were, yeah, yeah, yeah. And I was just about to say you, you're a great DJ. Uh, but if you're at a karaoke no. and somebody says, and next up is Dave Weir, you and don't say no, no. <laughs> don't say that. What's your go to? What's your go to song? I know after a couple of Jaeger bombs, you'll definitely go in the karaoke and sing. That we, we, well, when we did them Jaeger bombs, well, there was no karaoke machine. We was on the dance floor, mate. Wasn't we? <laughs> Last time we did that. Um, I don't really know, but you know what? I don't really like pop music to be honest. I'm more of electronic man so there's not much singing in well if you i would have to i don't know uh get a defective records tune out somewhere not carlo uh, minogue yeah. or anything though no mate not <laughs> sorry a bit boring <laughs> eh? <laughs> okay next question when are you happiest uh when i'm with my partner what's the silliest thing you've got upset about Don't know, mate. Really, I don't really get upset much. Come on, Dave. You must go. Just a silly thing like if somebody, um, if somebody pats you on the head when you walk past you when you're in your chair. Yeah, that is annoying. <laughs> that's annoying, though, mate. Isn't yeah, it? that's patchy. Do, Does that actually I've had it. regularly yeah, happen? I, oh I've yeah, had because it. you're little. Anyone that's small, they'll. Yeah. That's, you know, that's outrageous. When it's I was patchy. swimming, when I had my legs off, I had that. What? <laughs> what? I was did like, I nearly punched somebody in the nuts when, I, when they did it as well. Yeah. <laughs> I wouldn't say it's silly. That's patronising, I think. Yeah, mm. I hate that. Yeah. Um, where do you see yourself in 10 years? Oh. Um, I've actually moved to the South Coast uh, with my partner. Mm. She's uh, originally from there. And, you know, we've got a house together and... Just retired down there, I suppose. Living the life, living the dream. Still be coaching at some point, right? And yeah, still be coaching. Still got the academy. Um, there's no way I'll be still racing in 10 years' time. <laughs> you don't want to do that into your late 40s, do you? Who would do yeah. that, man? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> How would your friends describe you? Moody. <laughs> Moody That's Dave. it. That's Moody it. Dave. <laughs> <laughs> Last one. Okay. What's your greatest fear? Flying. Mm. Hate Dennis Burkamp. Paralo the, the Paralympic Hate version of Dennis Burkamp. Hate it with a passion. I do it because I have to. If I didn't mm. have to do it ever again, I wouldn't do it again. Yeah. That's why in Europe I try and drive as much as I can, unless it's ridiculous. But. Mm. Yeah, I pretty much drive to Berlin, to Switzerland. I even drive to my training camp in Spain. I just like that freedom. I just love mm. driving, guys. Don't mm. like driving in Britain, but yeah, I don't mind driving over here. 
Well, cheers, Dave. Cheers for your time. And no I'm worries, sure mate. all the listeners and much. viewers on the, on the podcast mm. appreciate, one, your honesty, but also finding out uh, some more about the real Dave Weir. Cheers, mate. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, guys. Cross comes in. White with the header. And here comes Whitehead. It's gold for Great Britain. 